Welcome back, everyone. Um, this is our final session of our, um, of our conference. Um, and now we turn to the paper age. Um, and we have a all-star lineup of scholars who work in, I want to say, late early modernity or middle modernity. Um, and our first is Esther Chadwick. So I'm going to turn things over to Esther. Thank you so much, Shira, and thank you to Caro, and thanks to all the participants of this fabulous conference, and to Steve and Juan and everyone at the Huntington. I will just share my screen. So my contribution is not about the making of paper, um, but about mechanisms for its control, about paperwork in the broad sense. Um, I'm going to be focusing on Britain in the 18th century, a period which contemporaries themselves described as the paper age. Um, I'm really interested in exploring this idea of paper's ubiquity, its status as um, the epochal substrate, a connective tissue that cuts against neat epistemic distinctions and discrete fields of study. Um, I'm going to conclude by suggesting how centering paper might transform the ways we write certain art histories, but in doing so, I'm really picking up on the, the broader point made so helpfully by Ashish yesterday in the Q&A about um, paper's productive disruption of disciplinary boundaries. So this is a sheet about repetition and seriality about authorization and witnessing. In short, about operations that lay at the heart of the 18th century British state apparatus. We start at the top left with number 168. The sequence is immediately disrupted by a cut, a sharp incision into the sheet that's removed what must have been the seven stamps before 176, where we pick up again and the counting continues until 200. There are minute variations in the spacing between each of these little devices, but each is essentially similar, save for the unique serial number. Printed in a brownish red ink, each contains a royal crown with crossed sword and scepter contained within a garter inscribed with the English royal motto and set against a mantle crowned with the word America and bracketed at the bottom with one penny. The pen inscriptions below help us understand uh, better what is going on here. Um, they read, brought by Mr. Thomas Engraver, two copper plates for the one penny duty on newspapers and pamphlets, the one numbered from 151 to 175, the other from 176 to 200 inclusive. The impressions whereof are here on this sheet numbered in witness whereof we have here unto set our hands the 10th of May, 1765, by order of the commissioners. So these red devices, the, 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 the stamps in the, the three lower rows, are printed from a single plate. And in fact, you can see the number given to this plate inscribed on the right-hand side, the number eight, while the previous sequence must belong to plate number seven. This sheet documents the engraver's return of the plates, these two copper plates, for the inspection of the commissioners of the stamp office, who set their hands as witnesses. And here they are, you can see um, on, the, on the right hand side, adding their initials in red chalk and graphic, uh, graphite in turn, followed lastly by Thomas Major, the engraver himself, who I'm going to keep returning to in this paper. The further inscription confirms that the copper plates have been received and will be deposited among the other plates and dies used in the service of the stamp revenue to be kept according to the method and usage of the office, witness our hand and so on. In witnessing their hands, we witness Thomas Major's hand. His skill as a professional engraver has been called upon to produce these official stamps with as little variation as possible in order to ensure their validity as markers of a one penny tax imposed by the British government on newspapers and pamphlets to be printed in any of the British American territories, um, the 13 colonies, provinces of Canada and um, the British Caribbean islands. 
money raised by the new stamp duty in America in 1765 was to provide the British with an additional source of revenue after the massive expand expenditures of the Seven Years' War and to pay for British troops stationed in America. But of course, uh, this highly controversial tax imposed in London on paper objects being used thousands of miles away sparked fierce protest, organized resistance, and rioting in the streets of Boston, New York, and elsewhere, as is well known. This was the inaugural outrage that raised the cries of no taxation without representation, born out in the American Revolution a decade later, and still, of course, shaping our world today. And here are some, oh, here are some um, well-known North American responses to the tax. So you can see in the top left, the Halifax Gazette printing its news upside down and adding um, a woodcut printer's devil to skewer the stamp. Or on the right-hand side, the Pennsylvania Journal announcing its own death with a skull and crossbones in the place of the fatal stamp. The stamp tax was repealed only months after Thomas Major had submitted his work to be approved by the stamp office. Returned sheets of paper had their obsolete stamps overstruck and the word America was eventually removed from the dies so that they could be reused for taxing paper in Britain. Rare surviving fragments of paper stamped with the disastrous issue engraved by Major in 1765 could assume the status of relics. I'm gonna come back to, this is um, a different kind of stamp from the same issue. I'm gonna come back to this kind of stamp in a moment. But surviving fragments like this could assume the status of relics, founding scraps of Americana like this one, saved out of the fire when some bales of it were burned, presumably in protest at New York. There's, there's an irony that I detect here vis-a-vis um, -vis Ashish's arguments yesterday about the American Republic trying to distance itself from paper. But here sort of paper returns as part of that kind of mythic founding fabric. The concept of obliging certain paper objects to carry an official stamp paid for before use originated in the Netherlands and was adopted in England in 1694 with an act for granting to their majesties, William and Mary, several duties on vellum, parchment and paper for 10 years towards carrying on the war with France. The origins of the stamp duty on newspapers of which this uh, 1765 America issue was but one iteration, lay in an act passed in 1712, which also set out a system of tax on the substrate of paper itself. It set duties according to quality and thus established a hierarchy of paper uh, types by class. We're looking here, and I couldn't resist including these, we're looking here at examples of the labels that paper makers were eventually, uh, this, these are 19th century objects, these eventually were obliged to be pasted on their bales, designating the class and weight of the paper and showing by means of other kinds of stamps that the paper had been charged correctly and when it had departed the paper mills so my point here is really just that we need to think about the stamp duty within a wider context of tax on gradations of paper more broadly. Paper products like newspapers were doubly taxed, first according to the substrate and then according to the printed content that defined that paper's status as a member of a particular print genre. One was never in fact printing on a blank sheet, but always one that had in a sense been pre-processed. Stamps like Thomas Major's engraved in intaglio on copper plates were printed onto sheets of blank paper, sheets that had been identified as the future recipients of newsprint in a rolling press at the stamp office in London in such a way that um, 25 sheets, the number of stamps engraved on a single plate, um, could be uh, printed all in one go. 
So this schematic uh, representation of that really shows you what's happening here. The, 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 the sheets of paper are being collated on the copper plate in such a way that only um, the 25 sheets and only um, the top corners are being exposed to the copper plates. The stamped paper, having been run like this through a rolling press, was then sent from the stamp office back out into the world to be printed by the various publishers, who having paid the appropriate duty for which the stamp served as proof, could then sell their products. Um, and I'm showing just um, uh, some English examples here, just showing you um, uh, newspapers with a, a red tax stamp on the bottom uh, corner. Other kinds of tax paper products, like wrappers for cards, um, were stamped not from an intaglio plate in a rolling press, but were embossed with an inkless blind stamp. And again, these are English examples. Um, uh, here, um, it's really interesting to see how the uh, card manufacturers have devised a form of packaging um, in which a window is left in the body of the trademark Great Mogul that can be printed around um, the official government stamp. Also subject to blind stamping were certain kinds of legal documents. And here is one of the blind stamps that Thomas Major engraved also for the new American stamp duty in 1765. Um, Again, what we're seeing here is this stamp being deposited into one of the stamp offices registers of dies and stamps, and we're seeing that that act of depositing being witnessed. This 10 pound stamp was to be embossed not on newspapers or cards, but on licenses for legal practitioners in the colonies and plantations. This was another of the British government's long distance control mechanisms in which not printed ink, but the ground of the paper itself would be quite literally pressed into bearing the state's authority. I find this juxtaposition um, between the optical word witness uh, with the blind stamp, the mark left in the wake of a moment of complete occlusion in the high pressure contact between the engraved metal die and paper sheet, extremely suggestive. Though not an 18th century term, um, contemporaries use the term dry stamping um, as opposed to blind stamping, as far as I can tell, and a little more on dryness later. The condition of blindness in this context refers to the matrix's inklessness, as well as to the totally sightless embrace of matrix and paper, which comes to bear an image not entirely optically, but more fully haptically through an intervention or disturbance in its own texture. Could we see this stamp as a, a kind of a useful material metaphor of 18th century British state power in its play between visibility and invisibility, figure and ground? The stamp is at once ghostly, both there and not there, visible only when seen in a certain light, and yet it presses far more deeply into the paper than relief printing with any pigmented ink would do. It bodies forth the figure of authority from the paper's very fibres. These sheets are traces of the moment when Thomas Major, the engraver, was officially separated from his work. They register the moment that he gave up the metallic matrices um, on which he'd been working and rendered them unto the perpetual service of their new author, the stamp office. But I'd like now to think a little more about Major as the stamp's author, even if he was only their provisional author. Major's self-portrait on the left, etched in 1759, is evidence of the considerable um, of, of his considerable ambition and self-styling as an artist. Indeed, he trained as an engraver under the French artist Hubert Gravelot in London before spending time in Paris working under Jacques Philippe Le Bas. He was part of an international coterie of engravers in London, whose activities kept the machinery not just of state but of the British art world in motion. While he took on contract work from the stamp office in Lincoln's Inn Fields, and I hope that our little videos aren't obscuring this, but I've put a red dot at the very top left of the screen, which is where the stamp office was um, uh, uh, for much of Major's career. Um, uh, 
So while he was taking on contract work there, he was publishing prints from his own premises near St. Martin's Lane and the, the red dot on the left just locates just about where he was there. Um, and these are some selections of his work. So he was publishing prints um, uh, after others. He was publishing his own prints um, etched and engraved after old master artists. This wonderful floral swag is one of the um, objects that he published, in, etched and published himself um, that were intended to be cut up as decoration for print rooms. As well as bringing in an annual salary from the stamp office, he was appointed as official engraver to the Prince of Wales and to the King. In 1770, he became an associate engraver of the Royal Academy. And all the while he continued in his role as official engraver to the stamp office until 1797. Now the connections between the world of fine art and the mechanisms of state bureaucracy embodied in a, in a figure like Thomas Major were spatialized in a new way in 1787 when the stamp office moved from Lincoln's Inn to premises at the newly built Somerset House a few streets away. So on the left is a view of the internal courtyard with the stamp office marked with the letter E in the um, southeast corner. As many of you will know, since 1780, this complex of new buildings had also been home to the Royal Academy of Arts of which, as I've just said, Thomas Major was an associate member. So to get to the stamp office, visitors had to literally pass beneath, and this is the image on the, on the right hand side, pass beneath the Academy's great exhibition room, pass the doors to the Academy schools for artists, to the other side of the courtyard, where bundles of paper are recorded as having been sent down a chute at ground level to the basement rooms below. Here are William Chambers plans showing on the left the layout of the whole complex and on the right a detail um, of the stamp office um, showing stamping rooms, a gallery for rolling presses and other offices. And this uh, is an interior view of one of those rooms from a print of 1809 where we see rolls of paper being brought in laid out in piles examined and hand stamped with screw presses by the employees the paper workers at these rows of benches. The large rolling presses for newspaper and almanac stamps uh, were housed in the adjoining rooms. A 1794 publication lists 46 stampers, three rolling press printers, seven layers of paper. In other words, those people that, uh, whose specialist job was to lay those sheets of paper so carefully as to print 25 at a time and two wetters of paper, along with the commissioners, clerks, registrars and apprentices. Later descriptions from the 1830s detail two stamping rooms, one wet and the other dry. In other words, one for paper stamped in ink in rolling presses, the other for paper subject to embossing. The stamp office was in some ways a microcosm of Smithian economy, with workers occupying highly specialist roles. Among the rolling press printers, for example, was a layer out, a damper of newspaper, an opener and marker up, and a damper of country notes. It was also a space of surveillance. In the dry room was a superintendent of the stamping tables, so perhaps one of the figures pictured in this 1809 print, whose job was to monitor the workers in order to prevent fraud. In his caustic memoirs of the Royal Academicians, Anthony Pasquin, writing a year before Major's retirement as engraver to the stamp office in 1796, described Somerset House in almost Pyrenaean terms as, quote, a most astonishing assemblage of contradictory objects in which the subterraneous apartments have every recommendation but light. In these damp, black and comfortless recesses, the clerks of the nation grope about like moles immersed in Tartarian gloom and stamp, sign, examine, indict, doze and swear as unconscious of the revolving sun as so many miserable demons of romance condemned to toil for ages in the center. A later observer um, wrote after the um, stamp office had moved to a slightly different part of the Somerset, Somerset House complex that uh, the pedestrians on the Victoria embankment 
who notes the clatter of mechanism behind the barred windows, is listening to the process by which the state makes paper into gold. Like that dynamic embodied in the witnessed proof of the blind stamp that I discussed earlier, there's a politics of visibility and invisibility at play here. The stamp office as a site of surveillance and scrutiny that was at the same time hidden away in a basement out of public sight. So I'll just end um, in prospective mode um, with this image of the stamp office as the kind of invisible underbelly of Somerset House by saying that accounts of visual culture in 18th century Britain have, have tended to focus on the spaces across the courtyard in the north block, looking at artistic production and reproduction in the Royal Academy schools and public spectacle in the great room. But when we follow paper down to the vaulted rooms on the south side of the courtyard, we find there, we might find there, alt an alternative history, another history of close looking, minute discernment and valuation. The work of an engraver like Thomas Major and other stamp office engravers after him who continued to shuttle between the spaces of government bureaucracy and the Royal Academy reminds us of the need to link these histories and prompts, I hope will prompt, explorations of image making and artistic production that might restore to the history of the paper age its fuller interconnections. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esther. Um, I, I love um, the idea of the stamp office turning paper into gold, of course, that um, <laughs> I hope we can talk about that more. Um, next, uh, we are going to hear from Nina Dubin. Thank you so very much um, to the conveners and to the Huntington and to my fellow panelists for what has been a really spectacular conference and an extremely welcome distraction from everything in the world. Uh, so the phrase, the papered century, was coined in an 1801 book on banking. But as Esther has just beautifully uh, made us aware, it was far from the first to encapsulate the 18th century as an age so permeated by paper as to be rendered synonymous with it. Such formulations like Thomas Carlyle's um, terminology, the, the, the age of paper, promote a powerful cultural myth of paper's mysterious ascendancy, its supernatural overabundance. The same period witnessed the publication of encyclopedic entries on histories and techniques of paper making, accounts attentive to the issues that our conveners raise. But this growing scientific literature, which John discussed yesterday, appears to have done little to stunt fictions of paper's miraculous ubiquity, which is a word that, um, that Esther also just helpfully invoked. By and large, to call the age the papered century then was in fact to parody many of the concerns that bring us here today, including those of materials, environment, and above all, waste. I want to take the opportunity extended by this conference to think about parody as essential to the conceit of the papered century. That epoch's inaugural event was the rise and subsequent crash of the world's first international bubble economy. This etching appeared in a 1720 volume satirizing the South Sea and Mississippi bubbles. Like legions of caricatures, it offered a mass public an entertaining means of cracking open, forgive the pun, the mysteries of financial life. Based on a contemporaneous play, the print at right shows Scaramouche and Harlequin of Commedia dell'arte fame parting the curtains on Paris's Rue Quincampoix, hub of the securities trade. The visionary who engineered the bubble was the Scotsman John Law, who a few years earlier had sold the French region on a plan for converting the nation's crippling debt into staggering wealth. Law's system, as it was called, rested on the infusion of paper credit into the French economy, first by way of new banknotes that would replace metallic currency, 
and then by way of shares in what is now known as the Mississippi Company, a state-run corporation that oversaw the commercial development of French Louisiana. Law's system harnessed the capacity of paper to ignite what in today's parlance we call spontaneous optimism. When the economist Robert Schiller invokes the power of a galloping storyline to move markets, he is in fact echoing Law's sentiments. In a 1720 letter, Law instructed the regent that the value of Mississippi Company stock lay in nothing more substantial than language. Quote, help to back it, speak well of it. You will heighten the confidence of those about you. And that confidence will support the thing itself. The problem with Law's system was that it was all confidence and not a lot in the way of thing. France's bank overprinted paper money, exchangeable for company stock, even as the Louisiana colony underperformed. Yet prior to the crash, confidence did serve as the basis for prosperity. This print captures the crush of the crowd that daily descended on Rue Quincampoix during the bubble's heyday, a period that witnessed not only a building boom, but also the invention of a new terminology. The words millionaire and nouveau riche derive from this period, as does the creation of the modern wallet, redesigned to meet the needs of a paper economy. The expansion of paper credit vindicated Law's claim that the system need only be backed by narrative. As he put it, quote, an estate in specie does not increase by speaking, but an estate in credit improves wonderfully by it. Not for nothing does the most famous of bubble caricatures by Bernard Picard elevate the goddess fame above all other figures, even including the temptress goddess Fortuna. Sidekick of the bubble blowing devil, fame with her two trumpets fulfills her ancient reputation as source of unverified gossip. The noise she spreads pertains to the value of the bubble companies whose personifications appear below. Paper's capacity to accrue value at the speed of rumor, championed by law, is here parodied by the personification of fake news. Buoyant on a gaseous plume, the goddess appears from behind the better to suggest her use of yet a third wind instrument, namely her derriere. As exemplified in Bernard Barron's adaptation of the work for an English audience, Picard's print was itself a widely talked about international sensation. This caricature of law deploys a similar iconography. Its imagery of clouds, bellows, and the absurdly airborne recalls Montesquieu's satire of law in his Persian letters as a peddler of wind whose sales pitch is as follows, quote, you think you are rich, trust me, abandon the country of base metals, come into the empire of the imagination. If you have creditors, go and pay them with what you have imagined and tell them to imagine in turn. With their bilingual address, such prints capitalized on an international perception of the bubble economy as a commerce in vapors, in wind, and a malodorous one at that. Works like this one spoofed those who heeded Law's call to enter into the empire of the imagination, thereby mistaking filthy lucre for divine incarnation. It features Law himself squatting on a pedestal above his worshipful flock, defecating a bill into the hands of a speculator. Like priests administering communion, two attendants pour coins through a funnel into Law's mouth. As Charlie Coleman has noted, the print burlesquing Law's recent conversion to Catholicism ridicules both the worthlessness of overvalued securities and the credulity of a nation that infused the stock market with Eucharistic belief. And I just want to interject that religious grounds for discouraging investment in Law's company had been cited by critics who protested Louisiana's reliance on the slave trade, a subject rendered virtually invisible in bubble caricatures. 
But what the print gets right, hearkening back to Shira's remarks yesterday morning, is that conversion, and more specifically paper as a sign of convertibility, lay at the heart of law's system. The financier, after all, had persuaded the public to convert its fortunes into banknotes, which were in turn deemed convertible by various state edicts into Mississippi company stock shares. As spelled out on France's new currency, its value lay only in the promise of its future convertibility. For this reason, commentators described the paper economy as marking the transition from stable, durable wealth to what Montesquieu called movable effects. Movement, replete with scatological implications, is thematized in the caricature. At lower right, Mercury, the god of commerce, has been immobilized, placed in a cage, and tortured with a wind bellows. His confinement emblematizes the sidelining of honorable merchants during the wind trade. The worried man kneeling beside the cage points at a monkey's conjuring trick and asks who will gain. The question underscores paper's failure to be converted into anything other than endlessly deferrable promises. The god's entrapment also speaks to the reversal of values affected by speculation when the hypothetical value of paper instruments eclipsed the worth of real assets. Put simply, in the papered century, things were valuable to the extent that they moved. As J.G.A. Pocock writes, property had ceased to be real and had become not merely mobile, but imaginary. Significantly, the product of Law's movement bears his name. The inscription identifies him, but it also draws attention to the novelty of signed printed banknotes. In an effort to inspire confidence in the authenticity of the new medium of exchange, the state issued banknotes that physically fluctuated in appearance. Not only did they vary in their combinations of handwritten and printed words, but so too were they signed and thereby authenticated by an ever-changing cast of clerks. By this date, signed currency in the form of handwritten promissory notes was nothing new. Bills of exchange had long served as expedients for commerce, but these devices tended to circulate among trusted parties known to one another, individuals whose signatures gave the papers their weight, metaphorically speaking. In the case of banknotes, the ever-changing identities of their obscure signers literalized the fact that whatever value these printed notes possessed was both variable and immaterial, not intrinsic, but rather projected. In ways discussed by Charlotte Guichard and Madeleine Filion, anonymous prints like this one, bereft of the legitimacy lent by a signature, aped the worthlessness of discredited paper. More broadly, in the cultural arena, the paper economy presented itself as a parody of non-mobile wealth. A dialogue in a comedy by Détouche reads as follows, says a nouveau riche to a nobleman, quote, I have notes of credit worth more than attics full of ancient deeds, which are fit more for nesting rats than for human needs. Responds the latter, quote, you dare to call tradition trash? To which his interlocutor replies, we bourgeoisie would rather have the cash. Or consider Thomas Bridges' novel starring a banknote as its narrator. The book opens with its protagonist declaring his intention to recite his ancestry in compliance with custom before acknowledging that his predecessors are unknown to him. The banknote names as his father the man who begot him when he received him from the bank. Law's system embraced the chance to parody a traditional order structured by lineage and inherited rank. The first generation of stock shares he issued were known as mères or mothers, and those subsequently issued were nicknamed filles and petite filles, daughters and granddaughters. The terminology marks a cultural tendency to personify inscrutable market forces as female, evidenced in the figure of Fortuna, 
and also in Daniel Defoe's famous portrayal of Lady Credit as a coy lass with an unpredictable temper. For Law to ascribe a genealogy to his stock shares was also to poke fun at the sanctity of bloodlines, a concept central to the landed nobility who saw in the system an existential threat. To spread wealth and thus corrode the hierarchy was promoted by one of the system's most powerful legends, that of the lackey turned millionaire, not unlike the rags to riches trajectory whereby soiled linens evolved into the stuff of banknotes, the system's magical elevation of the lowly remains a powerful trope. Gilo's etching follows the progress of just such a type, who made his living emptying chamber pots before Fortuna intervened and transformed him into a wealthy financier. In a sequel, Justice writes this turn of affairs and those made illegitimately wealthy are shown toppling from the heights of the social ladder. The artist who lost money in the bubble may have been robbed of his fiduciary faith, but these two works hint at his lingering belief in the category of the fine art print. In the hands of Dutch caricaturists, as we have seen, such confidence in the worth of printed matter becomes another object of ridicule. Consider this example. The seated artist is meant to personify the imagination, painting a view of the sparkling shores of Louisiana. The print thus exposes New World prosperity as a literal figment of the imagination, peddled by a deceptive painter. Various figures, including the indigenous smoker at upper right, emblematize the Mississippi Company's pipe dreams of huge profits from tobacco imports. What is notable is the work's source, a composition by Claude Audran that appeared in a 1690 publication by Charles Perrault, the Controller General of Buildings under Louis XIV. The book, titled Cabinet des Beaux-Arts, reproduced a decorative schema that adorned the author's home, comprised of allegories of the arts. The volume equally functions as an homage to the monarch whose cultivation of the arts, writes Perrault, has ennobled them to the rank of virtues on par with justice, prudence, and wisdom. The print shows the figure of painting honoring the Sun King with a picture bearing the words I make all things flourish. In the late 17th century, such a statement referenced the perceived powers, not only of the monarch, but also of print itself. Reproductive prints, claimed Roger de Peel at around the same time, had arrived at a degree of perfection, elevating all who looked upon them and allowing for the acquisition of knowledge, taste, and refinement. Ironically, by 1690, Perrault had been removed from court and Louis XIV was on track to bankrupt the kingdom. What further makes the print an easy target for a Dutch caricaturist is its belief in the enduring legacy of Le Grand Siecle and more, its conviction in the very idea of legacy itself. This is evidenced when Perrault proclaims Louis XIV the protective father of the arts Moreover, as Madeleine Fillion underscores, in invoking the Audran dynasty, the prince inscription secures it the value both of a prestigious name and of ancestral tradition alike. The seismic impact of the 1720 crash rendered such claims to continuity comical. The anonymous caricature overturns more than its predecessor's promise of refinement. It converts Audran's virtuous beauty into a cheap seductress, a fine engraving into a crude etching, and the ennobling power of print into the ruinous effects of paper. Again, to quote Shira, the work at left serves as a binding agent. It binds a circulating image to a purportedly timeless fixed set of values, literally fixed, in that it reproduced the interior of a property. In contrast, the caricature implicating itself in an economy of mobile and imaginary property of signs unmoored from any stable reference, 
narrate the devolution of paper from riches into rags. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. I'm, I'm so looking forward to um, bringing everyone together to talk about these papers. Um, our next speaker is Richard Taz. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Shira and Caro and to Steve and everyone at the Huntington for, for bringing us together quite against the odds and uh, to all my fellow speakers for their, for their brilliant papers and all of you for being here. I'm just going to share my screen. The last days of the French Revolutionary Terror were marked by wondrous events, as last days tend to be. Shortly before the fall of Maximilien Robespierre on Neuf Thermidor Year 2, July 1794, one such miracle took place in the unlikely surroundings of Saint-Lazare prison in Paris, where many of those detained during the terror were held. An orderly called Joseph Conge, misnamed in this print as Michel, was sent to deliver a message from an anonymous prisoner to his wife and children, and was so affected by their misery that he gave them 50 francs, half of the money in his possession, telling them it was a gift from the prisoner himself, who's identified in some accounts, including this one, as, as Georges. When Conge returned to Saint-Lazare, he gave the prisoner the rest of his money, convincing him it was a donation from a well-wishing neighbor. After Thermidor, the family realized what had happened and publicized Conge's good deed. His celebrity grew and he was extolled as a model of virtue and compassion at odds with the violence of his time. His actions were the subject of poems and plays, eight in total, notably by Michel-Jean Sedin and by Julie Condé, as well as paintings and prints, such as this one. The last decade of the 18th century saw an explosion of paper put to newly politicized uses. In Le Nouveau Paris, Louis Sebastian Mercier famously decried the excess of paper the revolution had let loose, philosophical and political treatises, plans and maps, libels and pamphlets, posters in many colors. He listed white, blue, golden, violet, yellow, gray and red, bills, receipts and legal documents relating to the sale of national properties, more than 30,000 new laws, the ever expanding paperwork of the state and of political clubs, death sentences, taxation forms, newspapers, letters, passports, calendars, citizenship cards, paper money. The list was endless. And from new presses to new archives, the spaces of pro paper proliferated too. The clamor of paper was everywhere, whispering murder, shouting pillage, and always obeyed. This is how Mercier saw it. And there's something dead on in his conflation of materiality and polyphonous noise. Paper's indexical power was such that for artists working in other media, there was sometimes no substitute. Take Le Barbier, for instance, sticking the printed articles of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen to his painting and varnishing the whole thing. Millions of reams alone, Mercier claimed, were used for printing acts of accusation, or criminal charge sheets, some of which can be seen in the boxes on the right-hand background of this 1797, um, uh, the 1797 print made after a play by Duconcel, a former Jacobin turned royalist. Illustrating um, uh, this escalation of paper with uncanny efficiency, that's an old, an old favorite, um, one, in, one of many illusionistic prints that appeared after the terror, in this case on a fan sheet, representing the assignats, cartes de sûreté, patents, billets de confiance, receipts, and pertinently here, and arrest warrant, and a tricolor hued laissez passer, or pass. In the aftermath of the revolution, paper was instrumentalized to articulate recent histories of revolutionary participation. It was central to claims for culpability or reparation, and assorted papers were also mobilized as defense against recrimination for involvement in regicide. The case of Antoine Louis Francois Serge Marceau is instructive here. Born in 1751 and dying at the age of 95 in 1847, the life of this printmaker spanned the age of revolutions. Trained in the studio of Augustin de Saint-Aubin, Serge Marceau was an established portrait engraver at the outbreak of revolution. However, he's better known for the role he played in revolutionary politics. Secretary of the Jacobin Club, Serge Marceau was a chief of police for several years during the 1790s, a deputy to the National Convention, he was a member of the Commission for the Conservation of Artistic Monuments. He helped found the Musée Francais, and he was involved in drafting new laws on copyright. 
In Peripatetic Exile After the Terror, Saint-Jean Marceau wrote extensively about his revolutionary life. He corrected histories by Tocqueville and others. He forwarded documents from the era. He corresponded with anyone who'd listen and attempted to justify his role in the September prison massacres and his vote for the King's death. During this time, Sejon Marceau also produced a number of uh, lengthy sentimental tributes to his wife, Emira, sister of the general Marceau de Gravier, whose name Sejon added to his own, and herself an artist and printmaker in which emotional experience merged with national history. Emira was um, an anagram of Marie, as if in homage to the typographer's reordering of letters. And Sejan described her manners and features meticulously down to the mole on her nose. For Sejan Marceau, as for many others, paper held unique possibilities, the means by which a constructed narrative of self might be developed to reframe a complex past. The apparent abundance that characterized the period's paper ecology and corresponding new attitudes to do with paper's proliferation, preservation and disposal, the possibility and also anxiety that if paper could be dispensed with, then so could the pasts it represented, bore here the imprint of political evasion and historical revisionism. The revolution's hyperproduction of paper was ironized, turned on itself, and used to affirm new kinds of legitimacy among those subject to recrimination, dispersal or exile. As Sergio Lizato reminds us, despite the revolution's evident violence, most of its main protagonists survived. What to do with them? With this in mind, I've been interested recently in what it might mean to pass as post-revolutionary, how mm -hmm. revolutionary politicians, artists, and many others around the world, this is a global problem, tried to justify or reinvent their place in a new political settlement following the terror and the mechanisms of disavowal or assimilation they employed to move often by necessity, as if invisible, to develop or perform another identity as easily and immediately as they had their revolutionary ones, to flirt with imposture and improvisation in ways that also demanded new forms of consistency. As Antoinette Lafarge writes, imposture's outstanding characteristic is in the matter of its being sustained over time. Paper was central to these processes. While Sejan Marceau's post-revolution paperwork, his erasures and reinscriptions were geared towards exculpation, other examples were coded as virtuous in a different way. Paper objects found a place at the heart of sentimental tales of personal sacrifice under exceptional circumstances and were reproduced in multiple media throughout the 19th century. Which brings me back to the representation of Joseph Cange's financial sacrifice and his pretense, his white lies, as seen in two paintings of him by Pierre-Nicolas Legrand, especially, which attempt to renegotiate Jacobin criteria for political virtue after the terror. Unusual among Thermidorian images in their positive representation of a sans-culotte, Legrand's most fully realized version of the Cange story is a good deed is never forgotten, exhibited at the Salon of 1796. The artist had also painted a portrait of the prison official, which was the model for a print by Pierre Belgeon presented to the National Convention in December 1794. A good deed represents the moment when the prisoner and his family approached Conge to tell them they were aware of what he'd done to express their gratitude. In the background, Conge's wife, surrounded by three children from their marriage, looks on in surprise, perhaps consternation, while three older children Conge adopted from his brother-in-law who died in the Revolutionary Wars are to the left-hand side of the painting. Legitimacy is at stake here. The revolutionary credentials of the adopted children are supported by their clothing. The older child in the background sports headgear emulating his father's, a trickle or variation on what seems to be a bonnet rouge, but is in actual fact a marker of Conge's profession. Meanwhile, the gesturing child has oak branches across his lap and his, at his feet, signifying steadfastness and the law, and acknowledging the arcane language of revolutionary allegory, the stuff of letterheads, vignettes, and stamps on official documents, and, well, laws. Operating in a vein mined effectively by Boilly, the genre, this genre scene replicates the Rousseau-inspired homilies on child-rearing that had so influenced revolutionary ideology, the mother with children, the centrality of the family and the father as ambivalent archetype for sons are all commonplaces. Despite the signs of community fraternity even, there's a pronounced social antagonism to this tableau. 
The former prisoner and his wife are sartorially marked as, at the very least, bourgeois, despite the cockade in his hat. The servant behind them also suggests their differential position of power in relation to Conge and his family. Conge's stiff pose and expressionless, unshaven face contrast with the exuberance of the prisoner's sentimental embrace, while his family's awestruck expressions could as easily be interpreted as suspicion. Conge and his family posed in the studio of Le Grand and his wife, the miniaturist, and indeed the piece retains some of sense of an imbalanced Imbal the imbalanced re relationship of power between artist and sitter, displaced onto that between Conch and the grateful prisoner. The stage equality of this painting may certainly be um, put alongside contemporary theatrical productions of the Conch story in which the scene, this scene forms the dramatic denouement. In other words, the painting made sense as part of a paper ecology in which paper was at once material substrate, animating force and political ground. Paper performs a historical role in a good deed. Shredded posters announcing recent laws and the sale of properties are affixed to the column on the left, while paper objects appear on the ground on the left-hand side of the image and possibly in the right-hand background too. The disposability of paper was at this time an easy allegory for the ephemerality of political regimes. And of course, paper was at the heart of the Cage story in the form of covertly circulating letters and paper money that neatly split a hundred francs in Conge's possession. The happy resolution provided by the narrative, the fact that post Thermidor such heartwarming tales of financial beneficence could be brought into the light, rendered clear and meaningful, seems at some level a response to anxiety about paper money's dematerialization, its lack of meaning or substance that plagued it through the revolution and which were deeply felt in the period when this image was made as Asinia were withdrawn and destroyed in large quantities. And here's the uh, reverse side of a version of that fan I, uh, I showed earlier with a, with a greedy speculator on the right-hand side and the desperate citizen surrounded by worthless paper currency on the left. The Asinia's replacement, the, the Manda Territorio, were introduced by the directory in March, 1796 and also attempted to pass muster, or they too were soon found out and withdrawn in turn in early 1797. But in the little time that remains, I want to focus in not on these aspects of the Conge story that aren't pictured here, but on a detail that Legrand thought necessary to push to the forefront of both his paintings, which I consider a substitute for the unstable matter of paper at this time and for the other kinds of paper that envelop the tale. One of the most striking features of Legrand's portrait is its representation of Conge's laissez passer attached to the left-hand side of his jacket. The scruffy ruff of Conge's scarf and shirt seem to reverse engineer the presence of this object, taking us back to the rags used in its production, or not, uh, and eliding their difference through remediation. It's also not immediately apparent that this is paper we're meant to be looking at rather than fabric. This document places Conge within his occupational milieu and connotes a freedom of movement opposed to the constraint of his wards. Presumably too, the laissez passer is meant to signify Conge's freedom of will, his decision to act according to ennobling moral criteria. As a paper form, laissez passer predated the 1790s. At the level of state bureaucracy, they were displaced by the passports introduced during the revolution, such as this one, which documented the appearance of individuals noting facial scars and other features, in this example, a small mole, marked them as having been seen by multiple clerks and police accumulating signatures and stamps as they went and permitted limited freedom of movement. But the laissez-passer lived on in other guises, in official spaces, the military, officers, prisons. Not all bodies, uh, not all people are required to wear paper in this way, of course, but working bodies, working people, required to prove or justify themselves, to prove their presence. The laissez-passer appears again in A Good Deed. It identifies Conge by name and gives his prior occupation. And it's telling that this portrait within a portrait is absent from the print by Belgium, where the text gives Conge's name, his place of work and his date and place of birth. Paper itself, itself replacing the skeuomorphic representation of paper in the paintings. It seems it was imperative to identify Conge so he might be recognizable to the salon audience and recognizable he is. The earlier portrait and the prints produced after it undoubtedly helped in this regard, and Legrand is loyal to his portrait, practically reproducing it in this larger genre piece. 
all images of him zero in on his prominent mole. Before becoming a commissaire at the prison, Conge had worked as a wig maker, a profession, a profession that, as Valerie Mainz observes, was poorly regarded and was associated with depravity and dishonesty. Their primary clientele lost with mass immigration and the imprisonment of aristocrats and the revolutionary preference for an unadorned head, many wig makers sought alternative work. He's listed as a perruquier on his laissez passe, and that's presumably part of the rhetorical force of this detail, to dramatize further his selflessness, even a wig maker. At Saint-Lazare, Conge passed freely. He was an intermediary, a cipher for the free movement of people and information through space, for the circulation of paper, as opposed to paper as blockage, a seal or lettre de cachet. This is a story that sits alongside other narratives, a modern fantasy of frictionless, even paperless communication, or on the other hand, paper heavy reminiscence, Sergeant Marceau, for instance. In one sense, Conge could not pass. His distinctive facial marks distinguished him. In an insightful reading, Amy Freund, remarking on the preponderance of prison images after Thermidor, notes how Conge's charity connoted the essential goodness of the people that he'd been deceived by his Jacobin leaders. Yet equally, Conge's act of generosity towards what is here really a likely aristocrat, these images imply, suggests he was never perhaps a proper revolutionary, and if not him, then who else? Indeed, the generosity we see in this painting is not his, but rather the gra gratitude of his aristocratic beneficiary. Legrand too indulged in political shape-shifting, assuming the aristocratic name de Serran, while exhibited in a political climate where such an attitude remained dangerous. The painting seems to have accrued counter-revolutionary meaning, and Francois Pupil notes that at some point, a paper label with an inflamed heart and the legend, stop, the sacred heart of Jesus is, Jesus is with us, was affixed to the reverse of the canvas, suggesting affinities with the Chuan cause. And I'm struck here by this interpolation, this stop, which assumes the voice of the police officer or warden. But as much as this is an image that makes the meticulous identification of Conge crucial to its purpose, it's really only partly about him, or perhaps not about him at all. Following the revelation of his selflessness, a decree, of course, more paper, assured Conge a pension, and he died shortly afterwards in year five, employed in the Bureau of the Ministry of Public Instruction, paper everywhere. When a good deed was finally shown, two years later at the Salon of 1796, it passed practically unnoticed. The one critic who commented on it got the name of the prison wrong, mistaking it for La Force, even though Saint-Lazare was named on the document. It's in the nature of ephemera to be protean, to appear in other guises in different places. Its disposability is a convenient fiction, as it's always in tension with a resolute fixity, eros and thanatos. And as we all know, it's often kept, treasured, used to arrange the future. By the time it appeared in paint, Conge's laissez passer yet more revolutionary paper, muttering quietly this time, spoke less to attempts to specify his presence in a recently abandoned revolutionary place and time than as a means for others to move on in the present to survive. Thank you, Richard. I was on the edge of my seat. That was um, fascinating. Um, I think given the time, maybe I'll ask the, the three panelists if we could just have a little conversation and then um, we'll have a break and have our closing discussion. Is that is that possible to everyone? Um, well, there's so many threads connecting um, the three papers we just heard. I was thinking about movement. I was thinking about the parodic waste proof um, legitimacy. And Richard, in the paper that you just gave us, I was thinking about the deed as something that is, um, the deed is something that is done at, or something that is documented um, or done and documented, but it could also be something that is done. And I think there's this sort of inherent anxiety for the historian about um, what is done that is not, not documented. The, so there are many things I think we could, we could talk about, um, but the, the question I'm, I'm really sort of, um, itching to ask the three of you is about what, what is it that traffics between the bureaucratic and the artistic? Um, 
how does how does the the paper um the the world of the the bureaucratic world of paper um what what does it push up on um and into the world of the artistic and maybe some of you i don't even know how comfortable you are with um talking or, or conceiving of a, a realm of art um, and but this really you know was something i was thinking about when i was listening to nina and thinking about speculation um, speculation, of course, you know, in terms of how we think about um, e economies and capitalism, but also speculation as something that artists do professionally, um, you know, that, that there is this element of seeing involved in it. So I, I'm wondering if any of you would um, even even sort of permit the question or entertain the question about um, how the how the bureaucratic and the artistic um, uh, how how the one sort of um, registers force on the other in some way. I mean, this is something that I've been puzzling about because at the moment I've kind of got Thomas Major here and the Stamp Office here and the Royal Academy over here. And um, I mean, it, so there are two ways that I could approach this question. One is to say that, you know, on one hand, Major, the engraver, um, his skill is being mobilized here so that he can produce what is the necessary identicality, reproductive sort of um, invariance that is required for this bureaucracy to function. And at the same time, you know, at least from 1787, just yards away, we have in the same complex of buildings, a kind of discourse emerging around originality and um, sort of exuberant um, dif differentiation between artistic um, outputs, shall we say, in the great exhibition room at the, at the Royal Academy. So one would need to do something, I think, with kind of thinking about that, not as two separate spaces, but somehow maybe dialectically. Um, the other thing I would just say is that I'd, I really would like to know um, how I could uh, push this forward by looking more clo closely at Major's work himself and kind of really getting into that work. And I haven't done that yet, but in, in other um, work that I've done um, on, on, on an engraver, Thomas Buick, who is um, engraving both um, his own inventive vignettes for books and his kind of, you know, this proliferation of really wonderful, what he calls whimsical, um, inventions for book decoration and book illustration. He's also producing banknotes for country banks. And there, I, I think I've been able to sort of argue that um, it's it's the very processes of his, his making of the banknotes and the kinds of qualities that they need, they require to function, that actually does then inform some of the thinking he's doing in his you know, non-bank work, other work. So there is traffic there. I haven't yet sort of found it in 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 major, and I'd really like to think more about that. That's so interesting, Esther, because you gave um, a, a, a your first answer was really imaginative, and the second was really technical. Um, so it, it was interesting that you approached that. I'm just grateful that you approached it from both places. Um, Nina, did you want to say something? Well, I think that's a wonderful question, Shira, about the relationship between artistic practice and bu bureaucratic practice. I think I'm having a hard time with the word bureaucratic because I think while it very much seems to apply in certain instances that came up in the talks, um, it also came up in your talk in a way. I think you're discussing a very tightly regulated world of production. Um, but in my context, Amsterdam in 1720, I've compared it to like the Wild West before because the reason why somebody like Picard leaves France and goes to Amsterdam, I mean, there were several reasons, but one of them was surely the prospect of an escape from bureaucracy, an escape from the constraints of, of being an artist within this tightly regulated, you know, um, monarchical kind of absolutist world of academic and guild production. And when he goes to Amsterdam, he kind of takes up shop on the Kalverstraat in Amsterdam, which is exactly where the stock exchange is also located. And I think it's, it, for me, it's actually much more helpful instead of thinking about the, 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 the sort of friction um, between 
two worlds that have this long history of existing in friction, you know, our bureaucracy. Um, that in fact, I think it was much more evident that artists ha were given ample opportunity to kind of be forced to contend with their own imbrication in a new co commercial world. And I think that so many of these prints that I'm interested in from 1720, these bubble caricatures by these anonymous Dutch artists are really drawing attention in a lot of ways to their own complicity in this economy of paper. That's a great answer, Nina, thank you. Richard, do you have a comment about this? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a terrific question. Um, I'm not sure I have a suitable answer for it really, although it did strike me this morning that after years of talking about bureaucratic documents, uh, to audiences of art historians who are working on painting, I turn up at a painting conference and talk to uh, uh, talk, turn up at a paper conference and talk about a painting, which seems singularly perverse. So um, we're very uh, proud of you, Richard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I suppose, um, yeah, this relationship between, I guess, what might be called the extra artistic and the artistic in this context is one that really, really troubles me because it doesn't necessarily um, seem to settle or it doesn't certainly doesn't settle at this time and um, when you mentioned there the idea of the deed as well I think you know that was something I hadn't thought of as well the deed is almost a as a paper document in itself as a as a bequest as something that's transmitted to the future that uh, legitimizes certain kinds of future actions as well and is tied to forms of inheritance as well in ways that are really troubling in terms of a post in a post-revolutionary context um, I suppose at, at this time, and in terms of thinking about paintings like this, I'd also maybe think about, you know, and I'm using this willfully, but a term like, um, you know, documentary in a way, and I'm taking it wildly out of out of context and using it inappropriately, but the the kind of um, uh, turn to a form of realism um, that one finds in genre paintings of this kind after the after the revolution, where it's not only about surface and the registration of certain forms of surface effect in artists like Boyi, for instance, but it's also about the multiple and it's about um, the reproduction of certain kinds of self over and over again. And in there, I think there's some, um, you know, there's some ways that that could be, you know, connected to, uh, you know, other forms of, you know, documentary thinking within, um, within other other spaces that are more oriented towards paperwork, perhaps. But um, um, yeah, that, I mean, it's something. Yeah, you know, something I sort of feel I, I need to sort of keep on keep on thinking about. Actually, but thank you. Um, thank you all for the for those answers, and um, I think it's now time for our break. Um, is that right? Am I? Yes. I think that's right. Um, and so let's see, we are coming back at, can you help me with the camera? Yeah, sure. So uh, it's now 10 to 12. Why don't we break till five past 12? Okay. Uh, 15 minutes and then uh, we can wrap things up. Okay, that's good. So um, Caroline will take us through the, um, the, the closing discussion, but maybe some of these ideas can carry over. Okay, thanks to our panelists. Thank you.